Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and poisoning cases across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 11. How very exciting. 11 indeed. I've never said such a high number. <laughs> you can't count that high. You have to learn this week. All day. There's been no research. It's just me learning to count. How are you, Nick? Yeah, getting bored. <laughs> <laughs> it's that general feeling at the moment. It's, it's, uh, that, uh, oh, look, I'm still at home. The novelty has worn off. Did have a delivery today of 32 bottles of wine, which should last me at, l- at least the weekend. Um, <laughs> so lockdown's going well? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Why have you got 32 bottles of wine, Nick? Well, some of them are for you. Are they? Yes. Yes, but I only asked you for like two. You, you went overboard. <laughs> That's why I said some of them are for you and some of them are for other people as well. She needs two bottles of wine. Okay, better bulk it out. But it was when the man came down the road with the trolley. Like <laughs> you, go, you go into pubs and stuff with. Like, you hear the clanking coming down the road with the bottles and it's like, oh, that's probably for me. <laughs> yep, that's mine. Yep, my alcoholic lives here. Thankfully, I have no neighbours, so, <laughs> so no one can judge me. Don't you? Yeah, the houses are empty. I was going to say any poisoning this week. <laughs> Get rid of the neighbours. You're the greatest poisoner of them all. Pretty much, Nick. yeah. To confirm, I have do not have neighbours at the moment. There's no one living in those houses. <laughs> it's not that I poison them. Fair enough. Okay, well, we've established Nick has no neighbours, but lots of wine. And we'll have to socially distance exchange wine at some point. And a cover of darkness in a cape. So, Nick, are you ready to drink cocktails and talk about poison? Go on, then. Or we could drink poison and talk about cocktails. I know, I had enough of the poison last week. Yeah, that's true. So I'm going non-poison for a bit. All right, let's go sensible. So this week it is my story. Aren't you guys in for a treat? (laughs) I'm slightly sleep deprived and hysterical. But yes, I chose a story this week and that meant I got to choose the secret ingredient that will flavour our cocktails as we embark on our tale. Nick, the secret ingredient this week was Guinness. Guinness. Uh, how do we feel about that? We don't know. We don't feel well about this at all. Really? You're not a Guinness fan? You sound surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Have you met me before? You're a cider drinker. Uh, cider, Guinness, famously similar. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Nick, they're really similar, aren't they? I like a Guinness every now and then. I mean, obviously nope. I'm Irish, so, you know, we just, we bathe in it when we're young. You've never had a, a Guinness on a St. Patrick's oh, Day? I'm, I've, I've had one at some point. Like I've had a beer at some point. It was upsetting on both occasions. They were out of chartreuse. So, so with Guinness in mind, your love, your love of Guinness. My love of Guinness. Which uh, I think is a nice substitute for chartreuse. I'll just put it on the table right there. What were you able to come up with? A Guinnessy, lovely Guinnessy, lovely cocktail. Well, there are some classic ones out there mm-hmm. with Guinness. Like Black Velvet and things like that. And Black Velvet is Guinness and Champagne. Guinness and Champagne. Yes, which I, I even I like a Guinness and I like Champagne, obviously. I, I can't see those two together. <laughs> well, apparently it's not bad. Um, I must admit, I've never had one. I know people who have had one, um, like Ben. Oh, yes, my husband, he did. <laughs> he made one in my house. <laughs> and then we, we laughed at him and he enjoyed it. He said it was quite <laughs> yeah, nice. He did. he did. But then he, he did drink all the Guinness and all the Champagne separately after that. Apart from the one can that he left at my place, which is where I got the Guinness of this recipe from. Oh, good. So it's, uh, it's, it's a fresh can. <laughs> Absolutely. I did look at the date and it said 2019 on it. I thought, ah, fuck it. <laughs> well, well, at least you're drinking it, not me. <laughs> So there's there's black velvet is uh, yeah, so there's black velvet. Um... One of my favourite ones is um, an Irish black Russian. Uh, so it's a black Russian, which is Tia Maria, Coke and vodka. But you just top up with Guinness. So not a huge amount, just as a head. And it is delicious. Very sugary and very sweet. But um, it works. It works. I encourage people to try an Irish black Russian. So Nick, is, is that what we're having? No, no, uh, no, no. We're not. I went with something interesting and the stuff that I thought, ooh, I've got some of those ingredients in my cupboard. <laughs> Which is the basis for all your Which cocktails. Which is the basis for all my cocktails at the moment. Now, I must caveat this. About three, two, three weeks ago, I went on a rant about cocktails called martinis. Oh, and yeah. they had nothing to do with martinis. Now, this one, well, on the website, it's called a Guinness Martini, but I'm having oh, none of that because it's annoying. And I have tweaked it slightly as well. So I feel entirely ah. vindicated in renaming it. Fair enough. Um, so I have called it a Mysterium Mysterium. Yes, a Mysterium cocktail. That is a brilliant name. It's a good name. Where did you get Mysterium from? <laughs> Not the Mysterium from. Uh, people may be going, but I know that name at the moment. Because where yeah. opposite of where I sit is my big cupboard um, of all my board games. And <laughs> top right in the cupboard is a game called Mysterium. I thought, ooh, that would make a good cocktail name. 
I see the other option I had was I could have called it the pandemic. Um, <laughs> no. That would have been a bit too much on the nose, I felt. So. Ticket to ride. Cold <laughs> Express, actually. Cold Express. As well. Cold Express is a good name for it a need, cocktail. That needs, it needs to be like a bourbon. Yes, sort that's of cocktail a cocktail for a, a Cold Express. Yes, yeah, so that needs to be a bourbon. Ooh. This is a trend now. I think this is we should do more cocktails based on the board games. We've played Quacks. many a board game. Quacks of Quidlington. But great game. People. Quidl- Quidling Bird. Quidling Bird. I call it Quidlington. <laughs> <laughs> I've made it twee. Yeah. But a Mysterium, beautiful, beautiful yes. game as well, guys. If you've never heard of Mysterium, go look it up. Well, Nick has sent me through the ingredients. We are going to go into our isolation kitchens and shake up a storm. So we will see you in a minute. See you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. So we have mixed up our Mysteriums. Ooh, thrown us into a world of intrigue, Nick. <laughs> uh, delicious looking cocktails. Very, It's very dark. Well, yes, that would be the Guinness, I suppose. Surely not. Talk us through the ingredients, Nick. What have we got in front of us? Uh, so we've got Guinness, surprisingly. Uh-huh. Espresso coffee. Mm-hmm. Then we have vodka. Mm-hmm. Creme de cacao. So a slight chocolatey hint. Chocolate. Chocolate. Chocolate going on there. And then, now the recipe I found called for a dark rum. Yes. But I don't have any dark rum. So what I used was the vanilla infused rum that I made a few a few episodes back and I had some of that left in the cupboard which had been slowly infusing more and more and more with two vanilla pods in there till it is pretty much black itself okay there's infused and there's rotting Nick. <laughs> <laughs> there's it cr- trying to crawl I'm out of the bottle it's got a heavy infusion of vanilla Ooh, interesting. Um, so I thought uh, dark rum is always a bit bit vanilla-y, but it's, uh, well, we'll see what happens. It could be terrible. I followed your recipe. Um, I had to swap out a couple of ingredients. So I had to use my old favourite Kahlua, which I substitute everything for. I had dark rum. I had I had about a half a measure of Mount Gay. And then I realised I had some Kraken rum in a miniature. So I mixed those two together. Oh, yeah, Kraken's in. a spiced rum, isn't it? It is a spice rum, so I thought it wouldn't hurt. Um, but I also, I was just following your, your recipes and I, I think I made about three quantities of it. So, <laughs> so I, have, I have a lot of whatever the fuck this is. But yes, let's, uh, let's dive in so and try our try mysteriums. Nope, don't like that. No? No. Really? I like it. Nope, I really don't like that. Could you just taste the Guinness? Is that the problem? I don't know what it is. It's definitely stouty. It's definitely got a, a, a meaty yeah, flavour. It's, 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 <laughs> it's the stoutiness going on there because there is more Guinness than anything else. I think the Guinness quantities. I was surprised that there were there were two it's, measures it's of that of compared to everything else. I would I would probably half the Guinness measure on there. But then you've got the vanilla rum in there, which should be really Blah, sweet. No, oh God, no! no, no your horrible. second sip, no. I I don't mind this. I do not mind this. Okay, one out of two ain't bad. So Guinness yeah. Guinness isn't bad. I'm just gonna get a second sip. Second sip. I think it could use a little bit more spice, probably a touch more sugar, and it would be more palatable because it's definitely got an aftertaste. Just no Guinness. You just you just hate Guinness, don't you? I just don't like the Guinness. No. I might try it without the Guinness. It might. I think without the Guinness, it'd be fine. <laughs> yeah. so, make a lovely cocktail. Then I, I will call that one the Mysterium. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not wasting a good name <laughs> on this cocktail. Are we retracting the Mysterium? Then? I'm retracting the name. <laughs> I'm just not going to call it anything. It's going to be a series of exclamation marks and stars and hashtags and things. You know what, listeners, if you can think of an appropriate cocktail for the title Mysterium, because it is very beautiful, write in. Write in and tell us. Well, we have our, whatever this is, <laughs> this expletive deleted. Um, maybe we should call it that, expletive deleted. There we are. In hand. Nick slightly at arm's length. Mine kind of sidling up beside me going, oh, we're okay here. Are you ready for a story, Nick? Oh, I think we probably should. Okay, then. I want you to picture a graveyard, Nick. Exciting. Is it full of vampires? No. Uh, that's a boring graveyard. <laughs> I'm going to picture a different graveyard. Okay, you can picture the graveyard. It Yay. might have vampires in it. They are not part of the story, but maybe they're hanging out. Yeah, that's all I want. It is a graveyard in Grand Prairie, 60 miles outside of Chicago, Illinois, USA. I, I know where Chicago is. <laughs> and there lies a lonely grave nearly 140 years old. The inscription is barely legible, but it reads, Daniel Stott died June 12th, 1881, aged 61 years, poisoned by his wife and Dr. Cream. I know this name. This is a good name. Let us flash to a chilly November morning in 1892, where a killer stands on the gallows outside of Newgate Prison in London. 
A mob of thousands of rough-and-tumble folk eagerly await outside of the walls of the prison. They are so excited and eager to hear the drop of the heavy rope. And just as the hangman, James Billington, pulls the lever to deliver this man to his death, the accused cries out, I am Jack! <laughs> Did he cry out? <laughs> It's my death rattle. You're getting very dramatic in your stories. It's many years of training, darling. Yes. It's so much better than mine. Mine are like, this man was born on the 4th <laughs> of April and he died horribly. The end. Yes. Today we are discussing the case of Dr. Thomas Neil Cream, one of the most famous serial killers of the Victorian era and also our second alleged ripper. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm not entirely convinced about that Ripper connection. I know a little bit about this man, but what is very good, if you see a picture of him, he's your stereotypical Victorian villain. He's got he's got the big moustache, he's got the big top hat, starched white collar, the little round glasses. He is <laughs> absolute before he poisoned people, he tied women to railway tracks. <laughs> I guarantee it. <laughs> you have been waiting for so long, Nick, for a man in a top hat Absolutely. with a glass with a big moustache walking around in a frock coat and a cape, and this is your man. Why isn't he here now? <laughs> because you're serving these shit cocktails. He won't come around. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not going to get him, is it? No. So many people out there will know the case, will, will have heard of Dr. Thomas Neil Cream, Dr. Cream, as we'll be calling him in this story. This story that I've started with, which we will come back to later, possibly the most, the most famous thing about him, the, are these famous final words of his was he trying to confess that he was Jack the Ripper now if you've never heard of Dr Cream's story don't worry we're going to take you on a journey and we're going to lay it all out for you but for those of you who do know it trust me we will come back to this and we will pick it apart you mentioned how very famous he was because a lot of the people we've covered have been fairly local in their what they do in like they'd be like the London based or in the north of England or something like that. The local killers, yes. The local the local killers. They like to stick to their own. It was like he was in Canada and he was in America and he was in England. So I'm not surprised that lots of people have heard about heard the name because um, he is an international celebrity. In an article in 1931 by W. Stuart Wallace, uh, used the wonderful words, he scattered death over two continents. See, that's better than I said it. <laughs> I was just letting you ramble away there and Thanks. just got to have that up my sleeve just to pull out there. <laughs> <laughs> but Dr. Cream, born in Glasgow in 1850, the eldest of eight siblings. So he was born in Glasgow, but the family moved to Canada when he was four years old and he was raised just outside Quebec City. His father had become a manager of a lumber and ship shipbuilding firm. Thomas himself was very intelligent as a child and his father reportedly was incredibly proud of him and doted on him as the eldest. He was always being rewarded with toys, with new clothes. He was spoiled. He got so many material gifts in his youth. His father didn't really discipline him either. He would try to bribe him with gifts and favours. He was always negotiating with his son rather than reprimanding him. So it's fair to say that from a young age, uh, Cream never really experienced punishment or he never saw the repercussions of any bad behaviour. And of course he was clever. Instead of learning to be good he learnt how to manipulate and to get what he wanted. He was due to have an apprenticeship, I think he started it at the age of 16, at the same lumber merchants and the idea was, as with the rest of the children, that they would go on to the family trade. I believe his mother became ill around this time and Thomas nursed her and it was after this that he became interested in medical training and wanted to pursue a career as a doctor. His father actively encouraged this great source of pride if your son is wow, smart okay. enough to become a doctor go for it. yeah he was all over that so his son attended mcgill university in montreal um he went there at the age of 22 at university cream was a uh, he was pretty lavish in his spending i mean daddy had given him quite a nice allowance and he spent liberally he wore the fanciest of clothes quite right fanciest of jewelry traveled around in a very fancy carriage nice so yes jewelry clothes, carriage, he'd pimped his ride out like completely. His style. And he was apparently quite dashing in his youth. He was certainly charming. He had a way with words. He had a way with the ladies and he certainly liked the ladies. Um, he had a small eye complaint, but it wasn't very pronounced in his younger years and he had very piercing blue eyes. Um, he was quite sought after. But despite all of these antics and this frivolous spending and this going out with the ladies and drinking and enjoying himself, there was no denying of his abilities as a student. He did graduate with his degree in 1876. Do you know what the topic of his thesis was? Um... 
I do. Go on then. I believe it was chloroform. It was chloroform. It was chloroform. Chloroform. Chloroform is not a poison we have covered. And it's not one of the ones that I would have put down as necessarily a poison. Well, no, I think it was very recent to these events. Um, certainly only 30, probably 30 years prior to this, did the first really in-depth studies about the effectiveness of chloroform as an anaesthetic or a, mm. um, anaesthesia. We know chloroform now is... In the movies as the the soaked rag that's <laughs> clamped, rag over. <laughs> clamped over the face and you sort of gently go oh no and you fall down uh, uh. Um, at the time chloroform it was quite a savage form of anesthesia and so there were lots of tests and explorations about it but that was the focus of his thesis well a brand new thing it could have these awful negative effects in terms of arrhythmia and just making people choke mm. and gag and go Bleh, in general <laughs> and that's not what no, you, you want. don't want that in medicine bleh. It's generally a bad noise. He made, <laughs> made the bad noise, Doctor. <laughs> it is the basis for all medicine. It made the bad noise. So anyway, he uh, his thesis covered chloroform. There we are. In the same year of his graduation, Cream met a lady called Flora Brooks. She was the daughter of a hotelier in Waterloo in Ontario. And they began a romance. Happy oh, nice. they began a romance. They were shagging. Shag, <laughs> shag, shag. Comforting. Comforting, I think you'll find it's called. Comforting. He comforted her. She dropped her glove and he comforted her all night long. <laughs> well, they were reportedly due to wed, but in the autumn of that year, Flora, oh, unfortunately, fell ill. Fell ill because it was found that she had been the recipient of an abortion. Oh. Now, at the oh. time, abortions, not legal. Rather frowned upon. Not allowed. And often done with not the best practice by shady people in back alleys with dirty knives and horrible pasts but it was one that cream claimed to have some skill with oh he did it himself on his own baby on his own baby oh that's upsetting the influence is is that flora and he were to be married she fell pregnant and cream insisted upon giving her an abortion he did not want to get married he did not want to have a child with her He's a doctor. He was. Yeah. He had done his training. He was a doctor. He still had his postgraduate to complete. And he said, don't worry, I will perform an abortion. It didn't go very well, but she survived. Her father worked out what was going on and was furious, obviously, and marches Cream and Flora to the church, to the church <laughs> with a gun at his back. In, in the many, many pieces I've read about this, people saying, yes, he actually used a gun and he forced him to church. I, I think mm, they were just taking the words shotgun yes. wedding quite and literally. The, the priest would actually go along with that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you take this woman and she's got a pistol to his head? Go uh, on, go on, go on. I mean, shotgun wedding comes from yeah. somewhere. Don't think it comes from there. <laughs> so they are wed. Cream is not a fan of commitment. Whatever we can surmise about his reasons for wanting the abortion and for not rushing Flora to the uh, to the chapel before he shagged her, I think can be compounded by the fact the day after they got married, Cream flees to England. To England, he must complete his studies immediately. Sorry, love. Love you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> and England's the only place to do it. He flees to England to complete his studies. Poor Flora has just left. That's it. She's just gotten married. She just had a Ooh. rather horrific abortion. And nine months later, poor Flora dies. Apparently, apparently of consumption. Oh. The, the rumours around Dr. Cream become so twisted over history, but it's nine months later that she dies of consumption. Maybe there were complications because of the abortion. I don't think he swam back to Canada no. to kill her. And then swam back to England. That's the, all got a boat. You, you, you find a lot. Well, I, I found a lot when we doing all this research with various things. Someone has been found out to be a killer. That every single person who has died in a 50 mile radius or wherever that person <laughs> has ever been must have been killed by that person. Um, which is probably not always true. Um, and this is why in this story, I'm trying to be as thorough as I can. But I think some cases that can be taken with a pinch of salt. Yes. So uh, Cream is now in England. He goes for his postgraduate training in St. Thomas's Hospital Medical School That's in it. London. In 1878, he obtains his additional qualifications as a physician and a surgeon. He should have a really good career ahead of him. And now he returns to Canada. There's there's no indication that he even attempts to contact the family of his dead wife. He's back in <laughs> London, Ontario. The coincidences will never cease. <laughs> but he sets up a practice. Um, it was a popular practice, did well. The fact that Cream is 
has trained in London and Edinburgh would make him quite glamorous, really, um, as a prestigious doctor who has had international training, oh, yeah, especially absolutely. in England. Trained in London. It's very fancy in London. London town. And he's still quite a debonair figure. So he's quite in demand. He's a chap who touts various remedies, remedies that we would later term as uh, quack treatments. <laughs> but he claims to have all sorts of tonics, elixirs and pills that will cure things like BD and epilepsy, that he has complexion tablets. But he also has a call for backstreet abortions. Mm. His practice on his wife he deems as successful. Well, she didn't die, so... Indeed, mm. he believes, certainly, that he is capable of continuing to carry out abortions. And unfortunately, at the time, as we said, abortions are illegal. They carry quite a hefty price tag, so it is a very convenient way to make money. So he is doing well for himself, both in his quack treatments that can be done over the counter and also whatever nefarious deeds go on behind closed doors. But things start to go wrong for him in August in 1879. 21-year-old Kate Gardner, a chambermaid in a nearby hotel, is found dead in an alleyway behind Cream's office. Ooh. A bottle of chloroform lays on the ground Ooh, chloroform's beside back. her. This girl, Cream claims, when the authorities start to investigate, had come to him inquiring about an abortion. But she had clearly found the horror of her situation far too much for her and had taken her own life. She'd committed suicide with chloroform. Where did she get the chloroform from? Well, it's, that's, a, that's a question. OK, maybe some backstreet b- druggist gave mm. her the chloroform or something had gone wrong. But it doesn't also there's other evidence there. Kate also had marks on her face not consistent with self-affliction. And there were also the words of Kate's roommate who claimed that Kate had actually gone to Dr. Cream to seek an abortion since they had been having an affair. (gasps) (gasps) Shacked up they were. He reportedly was the father of the child, but he was advising her, don't worry, we can get rid of this baby. And also, but before you do that, maybe you should accuse a wealthy businessman who's a neighbour of yours of fathering the child and then we can make money. Mm. Now this is all hearsay, this is all conjecture from Kate's roommate but the words are that she was carrying his child he had said we will abort it but also we'll try and extort some money beforehand. Whatever happens Kate ends up dead in an alley from chloroform. An inquest was held But there's not enough evidence to convict Dr. Cream, despite what the roommate says. There's just no evidence there. And it was ruled that she died from the effects of chloroform administered by persons unknown. unknown. Mm. So he's gotten away with that murder, if indeed he did it, or even if he didn't. The cloud of suspicion hangs above him. He's escaped conviction, but there's bad feeling towards him. So he up sticks and flees to the US of A. And where does he end up? Chicago! Chicago! <laughs> uh, Chicago's amazing place to be at this sort of time. Mm. It's a horrible and amazing place to be. This is the time where Chicago is truly becoming a metropolis of the modern age. It's a city of commerce, huge development after the famous fire of 1871. This is where the first skyscrapers are being built. And it's also a place where there is gambling. There's a lot of labour, there's a lot of union work, and there's just a mass of corruption. Literally everyone is there to be bought. Every politician can be bribed. Every statesman, every developer, all this sort of stuff. Al Capone in a corner. But not yet, no. <laughs> He's biding his time. Waiting, waiting, waiting. waiting. as a fetus, <laughs> yes, apparently. Uh, Rudyard Kipling once said that Chicago was the first real American city I have encountered. And having seen it, I urgently desire never to see it again. <laughs> Quite the poet he was. Anyway. We're in Chicago. Dr. Cream has come along and the edge of the red light district is a perfect place for him to set up his new medical practice because he can continue to peddle his quack treatments and he can also continue to offer abortions. A lot of abortions going on there. A lot. His patients are not high society. They are all of the lower class. And the tragic thing is, is that when someone dies from the red light district, when a prostitute dies, if something happens to her, no one's really going to take notice. No one's going to care. Whether it's intentional or whether it's accidental, there's not really going to be much of an investigation if people aren't going to start asking questions because people are afraid to. So this is where, in 
this period of history, as we've just said, where you've got serial killers and everyone decides to assign every killing possibly imaginable to that person. People say that while he was in Chicago, he killed loads of people. Now, certainly he carried out abortions and prostitutes died. A couple of cases we'll come on to. The probable truth is, is that Cream was carrying out a lot of backstreet abortions for quite a lot of money. The death rate of abortions was very high at the time. Yes. Um, now, normally this is because these are untrained abortionists. They're not medical professionals. They are operating out of dirty back alley rooms, quite literally, with horrible equipment, no knowledge of what they're doing. They're basing it on old wives' tales. And most of those women are going to unfortunately die from infection or hemorrhaging or shock. But... Dr. Cream was trained. He was smart. He did very well in his studies. He could have had a strong career. So you would think if he's carrying out abortions, he would have had a fairly good success rate. But this is where we can start to see a glimpse into the psychopathy, because even though he could probably have performed abortions well enough, he just didn't care about women. He hated women. He wanted them sexually but he was terrified of commitment and had nothing but contempt of their general presence and he had a particular dislike for prostitutes. He he deemed them to be little more than cattle fit for butchering, as one writer had put. William Cauliflower, MD, great name, uh, wrote a book, Monsters of Medicine, and he writes about the cream had reportedly trouble performing with women Uh... he frequented the prostitutes many a time but he had difficulties in this area and he would take pills and self-medicate as a narcissist it's gonna make you angry isn't it someone who's been spoiled all their life someone who thinks he can get away with anything someone who's intelligent someone who's praised the rage will start to rise who are you gonna blame for that exactly and he blamed women apparently he sought to degrade and destroy women who came to him for help particularly the lower classes who nobody cared about So, as ever, we're talking about murder cases in all of these episodes, and we don't seek to belittle or undermine, trivialise murder or death. Obviously, this is a podcast where we bring a dose of comedy to it. But this is really fucking unfortunate for those women, because you do have to deal with backstreet abortionists, you do have to deal with untrained professionals, and the one man, the one man who was training across the continents, who's a proper doctor, turns out to be a complete psychopath. So it's like, oh, for God's sake... (laughs) In 1880, he is sometimes assisted by a black midwife named Hattie Mack. She would often take the bookings for Dr. Cream and source the rooms in cheap hotels for him to carry out the abortions. Dr. Cream was quite clever. He never put his name. Oh, this is for the this is for his sideline, not his usual. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. For the for the complexion tablets. It's fine. There we go. (laughs) Put arsenic on your face. There we are. No, for the for the Backstreet this shenanigans, he used his assistant midwife to help do the bookings and she sometimes assisted him in the actual procedures. Yes. But in August of that year, Hattie Mack hastily moved out of her apartment and the neighbours start complaining of a bad smell coming from her rooms after she's mm-hmm. left. And they finally force them way in, their way into the room and they find the decomposing body of a woman named Mary Ann Faulkner in the apartment. What's she doing there? Well, Mack was arrested, but she threw the blame fully... At Dr. Cream. Um, She said that he was an abortionist and he had performed up to 500 procedures on women during his short time in Chicago and he would boast about it. He was the person who had carried out an abortion on Marianne Faulkner and let her die and forced Hattie to take the woman and let her recuperate in his apartment because he'd done such a botched job on it, she ended up dying and right. Hattie ran away, fearful of what had happened. Cream is arrested and he is brought to trial in Chicago. Hattie tells all this evidence to the court. He performed the abortion on Faulkner. He forced Hattie to take her in while she recovered. When the poor lady died, Cream dis- suggested, burn the house down. <laughs> Just burn it That'll down. Do the I will <laughs> cleanse everything. Cream counted that Mac... That was the one who came to him for help after she had tried to do her own abortion on poor Marianne uh. Faulkner. Cream looks very dashing in the stand. You can imagine, he's there in his finery. He bought the best suits, the best hats. He's got his piercing blue eyes. He's very well spoken against a poor black midwife. Yeah, she's not going to get the, probably the best, get the best representation out of that. The jury are unwilling to take her word yeah. over the word of a handsome young doctor. White. A white man. His his <laughs> defence lawyer. White posh man. 
black poor woman. Who's going to win that yes. one? <laughs> Who do we think is going to win on that one? His defence lawyer absolutely used that. He he called uh, various words that we're not going to repeat yeah. here. And he also said that a trained doctor such as Cream would not have botched a job like this, for goodness sake. He's done hundreds of them and he's, they've all been he's fine. fine. <laughs> they've been fine. So Cream was acquitted. But he continues to cause ripples in his work. Well, this is the second time he's been acquitted of wrongdoing at an inquest or at a trial. So there's people must be going... Something's a bit off here. Well, there's Canada, and now he's in the USA. Yeah, so I they probably may not, may not talk to each he other. He won't be known in Chicago. Yeah, true, true. There won't yeah. be press reports, but he isn't quiet or subtle about his actions. Um, he does. He, you know, he comes out of the trial boasting about his success and how he's innocent. And for those who want to hear about it, yes, he's very successful at performing abortions. He's a master at it. Even though it's illegal, people know that this goes on. Another young girl dies after taking some of his special abortion pills. And what are these pills laced with? It's going to be some strange or chloroform in tablet form or something. Strychnine. Ooh, that'll do it. Strychnine! The second poison of the week. <laughs> I mean, yeah, two poisons. That's impressive going. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, he's experimented with chloroform, but now he's using strychnine. Now, caveat here. We've talked about strychnine before. We know it is her an horrific poison a horrific way to die from strychnine poisoning however we've also talked about the fact that strychnine was used in medicine Mm. back then in reviving tonics and pills to give you a bit of a jolt strychnine was used by quack doctors and was prescribed cream used to get his pills made up by a local chemist but they would always be sent back to him before he gave them out and that was the point where he may have tampered uh... with them, depending on who was receiving them but a young girl does take his abortion pills she dies horrifically an hour after ingesting them when this happens uh nobody comes knocking at his door they don't there's no suspicion aroused that she has died from strychnine poisoning people assume that she's just been ill but cream sends a letter to the chemist that he's been using from an anonymous anonymous source blackmailing him (laughs) someone's died from taking a dosage of your pills but if you give me money i'll never (laughs) tell what happens yeah that'll be the trick whether the chemist pays him or not in this case i don't know there's there's no reports that there's a success or any repercussions from him doing this but then a young lady enters his shop a very pretty 33-year-old Julia Stott, wife of 61-year-old Daniel Stott. <gasps> Scandal. Does that sound familiar to you? <laughs> Should do. We mentioned it at the beginning of the thing. You did, you did mention it at the beginning. <laughs> yes. The couple has heard about Cream's famous remedies because Daniel Stott suffers from epilepsy. Oh, not an abortion remedy. No, not an abortion remedy. Not, not an, a remedy to pregnancy. <laughs> I will cure your pregnancy by killing your husband. <laughs> you will never get pregnant again, I guarantee it. <laughs> it's novel. <laughs> They've heard of Cream's remedies, particularly his famous tonic for epilepsy. But apparently it was working. People people swore by it. Well, there's a lot to be said for a placebo, really, isn't there? At the time as well, just pills were all the fashion. Yeah, a, a medically trained, clever man has given me these. They must give me some good. And therefore I take them and I feel better. Yep, gelatine pills. People loved the idea of them. Popping a pill, whatever was in them, even if it was just herbs or something like that, they were like, oh, pill, it will give me a completely placebo effect. Strychnine as well, put into pills, has no taste. So no one's going to go, yeah, that that famous word again. It's it's a bad noise. The doctors don't want to hear, so. (laughs) Did she go, blah? No, she didn't. Oh, okay, she's fine then. But she's dying. No, it's fine. She didn't make the noise. She hasn't made the noise. She hasn't made the noise. No noise, no doctor. But Julia buys the pills from him and has a very nice exchange with Dr. Cream. (laughs) Oh, and she comes back for more. I'm sure she does. Again and again and again. And again, yeah, she comes back for some more pills and some more penis, apparently, because <laughs> they begin an affair. Oh, rude. Oh, the scandal. Scandalous. Julia and Dr. Cream, they begin this affair that continues over several weeks. The affair doesn't seem to escape Daniel Stott's attention. I'm sure it doesn't. Because at 61 years old, he may be epileptic and eating all these pills that aren't hurting him at this point. But he does notice the fact that his wife is constantly going to this guy's <laughs> shop and shagging him. And their medicine um, cupboard is just full of pills. I'm going to buy more pills, but we've got 5,000 <laughs> pills in the cupboard. We don't need more pills. <laughs> oh, I think we need to shop up. <laughs> so Daniel says to the two of them, look, I know what's going on. Stop. Stop it now. Stop it. Stop, stop, stop it. it. Or I'll tell everyone. Yeah, it's not a good idea. Because not long afterwards, Daniel takes his next dose of the elixir from Dr. Cream. Still taking his pills. Still taking his pills after he knows he's shagging his wife. And Daniel dies in massive convulsions. 
Now, this is where opinions divide. Now, I was going to say, is this a joint plot between the two of them to get rid of the husband? Hmm. So has she done him in because she wants to be off with Dr. Green? Or has he killed the husband unbeknownst to the wife and the wife is shocked and appalled? It could be either. Uh, I mean, what do we I think? Want to know. They're obviously having an affair. Do they continue to have the affair? They continue to converse. There are reports that Julia acts very strangely after he's died. Julia is the one who's there with her husband when he takes the pills. She's at his bedside. She gives him the pills. Now, possibly Dr. Cream has created a dosage yes. that she doesn't know about. And he's going, right, I'm going to get him out of the way. Don't worry, love. She gives him the pills. Oh, my God, I don't know. I don't know what happened. Mm. Or, as you said, it's a joint plot. She waits apparently 30 minutes before she calls for help after her husband dies. The neighbours, when they come to the scene, they, they say she's acting very strangely. She changes her story several times. Oh, she's in on it. She could be in shock. You don't know what you're saying at the time. It's, it's, it's a horrible thing. But no one suspects anything. This is only what comes out later on. The authorities assume it's an epileptic fit and they move on. Yeah, I... But Dr. Cream apparently doesn't understand the phrase quit while you're ahead. <laughs> Because he starts trying to blackmail people. Oh, fuck's sake, idiot man. He writes to the coroner, blaming the supplying druggist, saying the druggist who supplied the dosage for his pills is the man to blame. He's obviously mixed up the dosage. He's also trying to blackmail the druggist again, saying, give me money or I'll tell everyone. No one's investigating him. No one's asking questions. We touched on it in a special episode. But why do people do this? Why be, they are, he's, on a, he's on a roll. He's on a good thing. No one suspects him. And we've heard this time and time again in the episodes that we've done. Where they do the, such stupid things. To, and it brings such attention to themselves. Narcissism. But why? Like, why? If you had but again, to do anything, he's trying to get money. Got away with it scot free. It literally has yeah. the opposite effect. Every single time, it seems, in all of these cases, when Dr. Cream tries to black people, yeah. it never works. Maybe there are cases where it did work, and we don't know about those because they were never reported. That is a possibility. So maybe he's blackmailed loads yeah. of people, and these are the few cases where it doesn't work, so he thinks he's good at it. The coroner and druggist are actually friends. <laughs> so they talk to each other and go, What the fuck is this man? We're done with this man. Um, and they turn the tables on Dr. Cream. They get some of the remaining elixir from Julia. Julia starts to help the authorities. Mm. Either she's frightened, guilty conscience, or she senses this guy is fucking crazy. She's going to act for the prosecution. They get the elixir from Julia. They test it. They test it on a dog. Poor doggy. The dog dies. Oh. They exhume Daniel's body. They find strychnine in his stomach. Everything backfires and Dr. Cream is the one who's accused. He tries to run. He tries to get to Canada. He does get to Canada, I believe. He's caught and he's extradited back to the USA to stand trial. And in court, he's torn apart by Julia. She says he set the whole plan out. She paints it as an evil seducer and a killer. Other witnesses emerge against Cream, saying that he'd been talking about murder, that he was a serial philanderer. Um, the mother of a girl that he had been seducing comes forward because she thought he was going to marry her daughter and they would have a very nice lifestyle. Apparently not. So she comes forward and says he's an absolute bastard. Everyone takes a stand against him. Cream is claiming that Julia is the villain, that she planned the whole thing and that she was there and she handed over the pills. But it all falls apart. He is sentenced to life in prison at Joliet Prison in 1881. Ta -ta -ta. Mm. Julia vanishes after the trial. She moves. She changes her name. She's never heard of again. She's gone. So there we go. So, OK, well, it should be game over. Surely Dr. Cream is in prison. And this is the story of Dr. Cream. I don't get the Ripper reference. Hmm. And also he was executed in London and now he's in prison in America. Good God, you're right, man. There must be more to this story. Dr. Cream is in jail for 10 years. He's assigned to hard labour. He suffers greatly yeah. in jail. Uh, Joliet Prison um, is not a nice I prison. Any of them are overly pleasant. But I think it's reported that, that this prison is particularly awful the conditions are horrible even by other prison standards they go ugh. you know jolia is is pretty bad i read somewhere or i heard somewhere that you would you were given one candle that had to last you a month okay exciting fact about jolia prison um which is now closed down which is in the blues, is brothers, the blues brothers which is br 
brilliant fact. I've just got to... <laughs> I was so wanted to say that and I didn't think anyone would get it. All I know about it is like, oh, he's just fresh out of Joliet. <laughs> no, that's the prison. The, yeah, Jake comes out for the, the beginning of the Rouge Brothers. Awesome. I like that. So he's in jail. He is writing appeal after appeal when he's in jail and they're all turned down by the governor. His eyesight is going. He's becoming more and more addicted to drugs because he's suffering from headaches. There are some reports that, that all through his life he was suffering from syphilis, that maybe that contributed to the slightly craziness. Well, there were a lot of prostitutes. A lot of there, prostitutes, a so lot of prostitutes. So you're going to get something, aren't you? But eventually, Cream's family... When I say his family, it's his brother, mainly. His father, who doted on him so much, has disowned him. As soon as he hears about the trial, he cuts him off. He, he wants nothing to do with him. But his brother petitions the governor, promising that when Cream gets out, he's going to move to England. He's not going to be any trouble to the USA. Just let him go. Let him out. There's actually quite a few letters that go around. A lot of people are appealing for him to be freed, whether it's just because he's a doctor and he's respectable and he was quite charming. Eventually it works. In 1891... He is released. Conveniently, by this time, his father had died. He receives an inheritance of $16,000. Wow, that's going to be a huge Daddy. amount of money. Exactly. Even though, da even though Daddy had disowned him, he hadn't changed his will. Just before he leaves the USA, he does hire the fabulous Pinkerton detective. Ah, nice. Hey, we love the Pinkertons. He tries to find Julia. Um, Doesn't work. Oh, good. Doesn't find her. But any excuse to mention the Pinkerton agency. Love it. <laughs> He sails for England, arriving in Liverpool on the 1st of October 1891 and then moves to Lambeth in London. A place of poverty and petty crime and prostitution. Lambeth, that area. Quite nice now. Um, <laughs> so, I've been to Lambeth. I have some friends who live in Lambeth. So it's quite nice. <laughs> actually, it's where the Archbishop of Canterbury lives uh, when he's not at Canterbury. Lambeth Palace. Lambeth Palace. Lambeth Palace. It is his London house. Yes. So, yes. At the time, it was not known that the Archbishop of Canterbury frequented the many prostitutes. Maybe he I'm did. sure she did. <laughs> she? She? <laughs> she? Yeah, I don't know if she, but I'm... Oh, she's a terrible queen. She's no, a, she's a terrible she queen. She was out there and the music <laughs> called La. I'm sure she was. Dr. Cream, now, the time in prison has removed all trace of this charming, dashing man that once was there. Yeah. His eyes are now notably deteriorated, and this is where you start to see the evidence in the pictures. Got a, he's got a slight, I think it's bulging in one eye. It's, it's either a lazy eye, or he's become cross-eyed, but definitely his eyes are all messed up. Probably a few up. too many punches with people in prison. Quite something. possible, and also the low light as well would, if he um, already had it, he had, he had an eye complaint, so he uh, that would have exacerbated it. His skin is completely haggard due to drug use. He's lost half of his hair. He also swears, he babbles, and he's all always saying horrible things about women. There is an account of his character at the time. Women, poison and money were his preoccupation and his talk of women was far from agreeable. <laughs> he carried pornographic photographs, oh, yeah. which he was ready to display. <laughs> he was in the habit of taking pills, which he said were a compound of strychnine, morphia, morphine, cocaine, and of which effect he declared was an aphrodisiac. Nice. In short, he was a degenerate, a Filthy habits and practices. What a man. What a man. What a, what a man. He's, he's there with the old archbish. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Dr. Cream that we see from the photographs. He still is well-dressed. He's still in his beautiful uh, suits and his black silk top hat and his cloak. But he has the full-on twirly moustache, mad eyes. <laughs> he uh, purchases a pair of uh, gold rim spectacles. Excellent. And now just scuttles around Lambeth in a high-kneed walk in a finger pyramid of evil contemplation. Excellent. No sooner has he arrived, he takes rooms, he indulges in drink and drugs, he frequents the vaudeville shows and the pubs and the music halls of the area. He's having a great time. It's great. It sounds he's, great. It sounds fantastic. He's living his best life. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there and done that. <laughs> Got quite an affinity with this man. Haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> it's a top hat. Anyone with a top hat gets me. He put on a top hat. He can do no wrong. This man is a saint. He's got an excellent hat. <laughs> well, he's been inside, yeah. hasn't he? He's been inside. To be honest, if you're in jail, you're gonna shag and drink. You're your gonna way do, yeah, anything. exactly. You've got a lot of catching up to do. Oh, and he, he does it. He does it. He's got his medical supplies with him as well. His uh, little collection of elixirs and complexion pills and abortion tablets. As we said, he's out there living the high life, but Dr. Cream is still a doctor. He can still spin a yarn. He's still charming. And quite frankly, the prostitutes of the time are going to want him as a client because he seems respectable. 
regardless of the mad eyes and the twirly moustache, <laughs> they've clearly never seen a Victorian villain and gone, wait a minute. Apparently Jack the Ripper has not happened. They was like, oh, that was in Whitechapel. That's miles away. This miles guy seems away. fine. The Ripper killings have just happened and they're not suspicious at all of this well-to-do man who's tempting them away. He is telling them that he's got money, that he's respectable. They want a classy client. Mm. He's also very keen to show off in front of these women. You know, we talked about earlier that did he actually have problems with performance? He at one point makes an appointment with two prostitutes to go for drinks with them. They come to meet him at the arranged time in the street and he is standing there with another prostitute and very, very determinedly goes into another building in front of them to sort of show, look, look, look what a sex stud I am. Sorry, I can't go after you. I've got another <laughs> prosy on the go. And they're just pissed off because they've not got any money. But he, he makes such a show. So two days after his arrival in London, he meets the 19-year-old prostitute, Ellen Nelly Dunworth. So she goes to meet Dr. Cream in the streets. She's told her friend she's going to meet a very distinguished doctor. A few hours later, she fell extremely ill in the street. She's seen by friends, other probably workers of the night around there, people who actually live in her lodging, and they see her practically collapsing in the street. They help her home, and she is starting to convulse. She's very, very ill, and she says... That gentleman with the... Sorry, should, should I do a voice? Go for it. A white... A Lambeth voice. I don't know what a Lambeth voice would be at the, at the time. That gentleman with the whiskers and the top hat gave me a drink twice out of a bottle with white stuff in it. <laughs> Since shivers down his spine, doesn't it? You can tell you're an actor. She writhes in agony, gagging and fitting, and she later dies. Uh, it's recorded as numvoxia yeah, poisoning, i.e. strychnine. Strychnine? Strychnine? You say strychnine, I say strychnine. Let's <laughs> get those t-shirts made. <laughs> we do. <laughs> A few days later, Cream meets with a 27-year-old prostitute named Matilda Clover. He had met Matilda before. He told her about um, some marvellous pills that he had that battled a VD. So they meet again. Apparently that night she's seen with him and he's described as wearing a silk top hat, nice. a frock coat and a cape. Run, woman, run! <laughs> For God's sake, the signs are all there! <laughs> And he's got a big bag of knives. <laughs> and a scythe. <laughs> What's this for? It's for fishing at the poisons in my bag. <laughs> and after their time together that night, her household, the boarding house that she lives in, they are woken in the night by her screaming. She's found in her room, writhing in agony, claiming that Fred, the name that Dr. Cream goes by at that time, had given her pills. But she dies the next morning. The doctor who eventually treated her merely concluded that her death was due to alcoholism because she had a drinking problem. Uh. She's sadly buried in a pauper's grave. So again, these deaths could have gone completely unnoticed, except that Dr. Cream was greedy. What's he doing now? Who's he writing to demanding money for something? In the case of Nellie, at her inquest, there is an inquest, hmm. Cream wrote to the coroner, Offering the name of the murderer in exchange for a £300,000 reward. <laughs> that's a stupid amount of money. Even now, that's a stupid amount of money. That is literally going £14 million, please. It's not just that. He starts to accuse various high-flying people of the murder, including William Smith owner of wh <laughs> smith's bookshop anyone from england wh smith's yeah it's the grandson of the founder um i think it's his mother at the time has just been made a viscountess and that was in the papers <laughs> and he was a politician so he just writes to him saying i think i know you're the murderer can i have money please <laughs> they obviously go no you're mental no. let's just leave that be <laughs> he also wrote a note to a prominent physician dr william broadbent accusing him of poisoning Matilda Clover, a demanding cash. Uh, Broadbent actually is a friend, has friends in Scotland Yard, so he just forwards the letter to the police. Again, Good. we don't know if any any of his attempts at blackmailing worked because we we wouldn't know about them. Well, that's true, yeah. But all the failed ones, yeah. He, they're just all going, shut up, go away, you mad, mad man. There's someone with a very guilty conscience who's paid him and well, that's God knows it. how I mean, much. Well, that's it, because he keeps doing it. It makes <laughs> you think that he must have had success at some point. Well, he must have, otherwise he would stop doing it, wouldn't he? If you just kept getting failure after failure, you, eventually you would stop doing it. He must have had some I like success. To think that, I don't like to think, but I, I think that might be the case. But again, with narcissists, 
you just are oblivious to how stupid and wretched you're being mm. and that someone will believe me because he's so sure of his actions. He also meets a prostitute named Louise Harvey. He makes an appointment with her and he again <laughs> tells her that he has these pills that will cure her complexion. She apparently has very pockmarked skin. And on the meeting, he says, here are the pills. Don't take them until just before I leave. <laughs> and Louise is like, okay. Subtle, subtle. Uh, whether that she sleep together or not, I don't know. They definitely, she buys, he buys her drinks and, and they have that. They're walking along the riverfront and he says he has to go. And that's at that point he goes, take the pills now. Take the pills. Go on, go on. And she's like, uh, sure pretends to take them and then he runs away <laughs> cloak flapping behind him <laughs> and then, then he turns into a bat <laughs> always with a vampire and off he goes into into the london fog <laughs> she's standing there holding the pills watching this louise luckily takes the pills and goes fuck that and throws them into the thames but dr cream is left very sure that she would be dead by the morning Around this point, Dr. Cream returns to Canada and the USA uh, for a vacation to sort out some family business. There are records of his voyage home, and it is said on the boat that he is frequently drunk. <laughs> he boasts about sleeping with numerous prostitutes. Nice. And he really loves showing off his big collection of porn. <laughs> <laughs> it's true There's, the people on the boat are really upset He, it, it, they say his supply of porn is endless <laughs> he keeps showing people pornographic pictures here's your breakfast grapefruit please don't show me that penis it's a nice day <laughs> back in Canada he talks about the elixirs he gives to prostitutes that helps them getting out of a family way and again shows the, everyone more porn everywhere he goes but while he's in Canada, he also orders upwards of 500 pills of strychnine. Mm. And then back to London he goes. <laughs> There's an interesting interlude here that Cream did reportedly have a girlfriend, a woman named Laura Sabatini. He'd been courting her for some time, gets on very well with her and her mother. I believe she lived in Hertfordshire, actually, and he would go and spend weekends with them. Uh, Laura and her mother think he's great he's charming he's lovely he's got a very promising career he's a doctor um he's promising a good life for them people write about this relationship with dr cream and it's not one i really want to delve into because every report i found of it, it he did have this relationship and he obviously didn't try and kill her but a lot of people sort of romanticize it yeah. as if this is the one chance he had to have a a normal meaningful relationship i just feel a bit uncomfortable that there was a lot of stuff written about that you know maybe he had actually found love and it makes him as a quite romantic figure right. kind of sympathetic it's all okay because like, he found love in the end <laughs> or maybe he would have found love if he'd only stopped killing prostitutes but he comes back to london sees his girlfriend la 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 but on april the 11th cream meets up with two prostitutes not one but two yes. i have one when you can have two uh alice marsh alice, 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 marsh, alice, marsh, alice marsh um alice marsh excuse me 21 years old and emma shrivel shrivel or shrivel i want to say shrivel because shrivel sounds horrible uh she's 18 years old he arranges this double date with a the prostitute they go to the ladies flat to uh you know make a night of it and it's a special night oh oh they lay out all the stops they have some lovely tinned salmon oh. he's also brought along a couple of special bottles of guinness oh. hey! <laughs> well into the episode i was wondering where that was gonna come in <laughs> going, i was thinking actually i've forgotten the guinness what's going on, the guinness? What's going on? <laughs> at the end it was like, and then there was guinness yes. and then there was some guinness and then they all <laughs> then the, had guinness and they all had guinness and lemonade <laughs> <laughs> and he died no he brings guinness guinness with an extra flavor of poison <laughs> guinness in nick's book the greatest poison of the them greatest all. poison of them all absolutely <laughs> whatever happens in the room we don't know we probably don't want to know quite frankly yes i'd rather not um, to be honest i'm sure he's got some pictures of it <laughs> i gonna set my camera up show me your ankle oh. but they enjoy that lovely tin salmon there are some reports that the poison is in the guinness there are other reports that he has brought his medical case along with him to say Oh, you know those pills I told you about that cure VD and make your skin go shiny? Here they are, my darlings. And he either puts them in the Guinness, they share them with the drinks. The ladies have some pills or poison. He's, he's like a crazy Avon lady. <laughs> with a with a case of things. Look, some lovely things to make your face lovely. <laughs> I don't think the Avon ladies say that. I, I don't know. I've, I've not met one. <laughs> I remember an Avon lady from when I was little because one did Giving come you to poison. the house. 
Yeah, she tried to kill my mother. No, I remember an Avon lady coming to the house and she had the case and my mum opened the door and was like, no, none of that. It's full of poison. I know your game. I know your game. You're going to give me Guinness and try to get me drunk on salmon and poison. Well, come in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, he's not a crazy Avon lady. Right. Maybe that was his that was his business plan. He was trying to be an Avon lady and the women keep they dying. They just kept dying. Because they kept eating the cosmetics so they didn't understand Avon cosmetics at the time. This is a lovely highlighter to put on. No, eat it, you stupid <laughs> bitch. This is skin relovelification. <laughs> no, don't put it on toast. <laughs> they think it's an Anne Summers party because he's got the porn as well. <laughs> Okay. Moving on. Moving on. So anyway, they died. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Well, they did. Well, well, Dr. Cream leaves these two ladies before the strychnine has, has taken effect. Whether he's given it to them in pills and put it in the drinks. The ladies are in their rooms in their boarding house. They, they share the same boarding house. And again, people are woken by the screams of agony coming from the rooms. He never watches them die this is an interesting thing about dr cream so that's interesting we'll come yes. back to it but it's really important to note he doesn't stick around to see the death he just wants to know that it's happened and he's pretty convinced that it does a double murder two in one ripper never did that at first yeah, he did. not not two in one oh, go two, two, in one night, one night yes. yes but he put a bit more effort into it the ripper... what <laughs> <laughs> the Ripper put more effort into it. Well, rather than just poisoning some Guinness. Well, you just tore them apart. He took a bit more time. He's more artful in the draping <laughs> of the innards. Is that what... Oh, my God. Well, at first, at the inquest of these ladies' deaths, uh, they suspect... The salmon! The salmon moves. The salmon moves. The salmon moves. <laughs> Monty Python reference there. Nicely done. Indeed. And, and, let's try and work in any Monty Python or Simpsons reference as we can. There are more questions raised. And there is an investigation by a trained, thank God, pathologist who comes in and goes, I think this is... It's not salmon, for God's sake. <laughs> he looks in the contents of their stomach. He finds massive amounts of strychnine. At this time, there have been several deaths around Lambeth. The police believe they have a serial killer on their hands and the newspapers are reporting the Lambeth Poisoner nice. is at large. They're looking for a man who matches the descriptions given. When they are calling for information, several prostitutes do come forward. They mention the case of Matilda Clover. Her body is exhumed from the pauper's grave. This took a long time for them to find her body. Yeah, that's, that's a lot yeah, of effort. Yeah, it's again, find right allegedly, one. they find it in the pauper's grave. There was one bit of writing it, it's saying it took about two weeks to find her stomach. Yeah. Um, but they did. But they find strychnine in her stomach. Even though there's reports in the newspaper about the Lambeth Poisoner. He is still blackmailing people. <laughs> He is still just sending letters around. He writes to the father of a doctor who lives in his building, Joseph Harper, saying that his son is responsible for the deaths and give him £1,500 and he won't tell anyone. Cream is also friends. He's made acquaintances with an ex-New York detective, a man called John Haynes. It's, he's an ex-detective and yet Dr. Cream continually discusses the murder cases, <laughs> reveals details and knowledge that has never been released to the public. Hayes' suspicion is aroused. They go on walks around the neighbourhood. Dr. Cream is pointing out the spots where the women died, talks about what kind of MO he would have used and what the sex might have been like with the prostitutes Haynes is backing away at this point going yeah that, that's really great Tom that's really this oh <laughs> must be off obviously goes to Scotland Yard to a detective there and tells him what he's heard Scotland Yard and with the help of this man they start to piece the puzzle together Dr. Green is put under police surveillance. He's been using different names. We know he's been saying his name is Fred to the prostitutes. He's also been going under Dr. Neil to others rather than Dr. Cream. So his past yeah. won't catch up with him. They uncover his history from Chicago. They start to piece back to Canada. They know that he is an ex-con. And eventually they're able to match up the handwriting of one of his letters to his beloved Laura, to one of the letters sent to Walter Harper blackmailing him about his son and that is enough to arrest him at first there was an inquest into the deaths of the two prostitutes that he killed at once but maybe his biggest mistake was assuming that he had killed louisa harvey because during the inquest louisa harvey walks into the courtroom Ooh. the woman that he had given pills to yeah he thought he had and killed yeah, by saying the take them and running off into the night apparently when she walked in his face paled his eyes twitched and his whole body froze it also transpires at this inquest that laura sabatini had been writing letters for him 
to the people he was blackmailing. He had sold her a story that it was just part of a police investigation that he was helping with and she was so innocent that she believed him and she gives evidence. They determine at the inquest that Matilda Clover died by Thomas Neal Cream's hands and he's moved to the formal trial. I think it's initially just one prostitute that he is accused of killing, but then they say the evidence mounts up. But there, there is so much evidence yeah. that you have to take these crimes into account. I think it's Matilda Clover that he's actually technically tried for, but everyone else is brought in, and for trying to extort money from everyone, apparently. <laughs> everyone in England, yeah. The case is cut and dried. He killed at least four women with strychnine. He tried to blame others. He tried to extort money, and he's an ex-con. The defence said he's addicted to loose women and drugs and he's only been threatening people with extortion. He wouldn't do it. <laughs> Takes the jury 10 minutes. He's guilty. And Judge Hawkins pronounces death by hanging. In the days leading up to the hanging, he's heard wandering around his cell muttering, they will never hang me, they will never hang me. But eventually he is led out onto the gallows on the 15th of November and he is hanged by the neck until he is dead. But with those famous last words, just before the rope stretches and the trapdoor pulls away he says i am jack no he's not <laughs> <laughs> so the case of dr thomas neil cream there good case it's there's so much to that case that is i genuinely feel that case is fascinating because I, he led two lives he had his life in canada and, and in chicago where he is young and debonair he is an abortion doctor and he's killing people certainly whether it is premeditated murder or whether he is just being sloppy but then he has an entirely other life in London where he comes over and is every bit the Victorian villain with the top hat and the squinty eye, just murdering prostitutes, it's, just killing them with strychnine. Because if you look at, if you Google his name and you can actually find pictures of him when he was younger, um, and he he is incredibly dashing, very, mm. very suave, very, very fancy looking. Um, so I'm not surprised he drew so much, so much attention to him and he was this quite glittering sort of character. And then you see him when he's in London, and he does, as you say, look like that complete Victorian villain. And it's, it's difficult to see that they're the, they're the same person. Yeah. Because the, the difference is, is, so star- is so striking. And it's strange that, again, in, in the benefit of hindsight of the murders that he committed in London, people look back at his life in Chicago and in Canada. And I will go out on a limb and say that a lot of those deaths are probably circumstantial, that I don't, they don't feel in the same vein as the murders that he committed later on. He's unquestionably a not pleasant man and has no regard for women's safety and no regard for women. But he's an abortion doctor. And, yeah. And, and so he was... death is not uncommon. I'm not saying he's blameless for it, but there seems to be a lot of coincidence. In the States, it doesn't appear like he's gone out of his way to murder someone for the sake of killing them. No. And now I'm sure when he carried out his backstreet abortions, he did not do them with the slightest bit of care or effort to to save lives or mm. anything like that. They were incredibly slapdash. But it was part of he he did the he did the job and if they died they died. Yeah, which is which is horrible in itself. Which which is a which is a horrible thing when you think, okay, he's a trained medical doctor. He's he's taken an oath to do no harm and all that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. In back in London, he is purposely going out there with the sole intention of killing people yeah and not as a byproduct of other activities when you do think about what he did in america and in canada much as it's part of the job he could have saved them oh, so I'm, no doubt he could have he just saw the lives as not worth saving yeah he I... just saw that as as a means for money and whether he was actually intentionally botching the operations just so he could see them die we don't know, but he could have looked after them. He could have used his Absol- training absolutely. to other abortions. I mean, I mean, as you said, I mean, there seems to be a, the thread that runs through the whole thing is a complete hatred of, of women. Mm. And then he's been put in prison, gone slightly, in, well, he's gone very crazy. Mm. And then it's just gone to London and gone, ah, oh, fuck it, I can do whatever. Yeah, well, so but interesting, go... you say, because he never, in London, he never stuck around to see the results of his work purely, here, take this and I'm off. He's clearly trying to kill them. He's giving them strychnine. He wants them to suffer. He wants them to suffer, but he doesn't watch. He doesn't stay around to watch. That is something actually very interesting to talk to to Roe about, actually. Would it be a 
a guilt thing that he he's he's done this terrible thing, but he can't watch the end result. Maybe it is. It's... So he's got to go, or what? What? What is it in the head that means I, I, I know they're going to die, and I know I've killed them, but I can't watch it happen. I don't know. Maybe it is just something in the illusion of it. He he genuinely thought that Louisa Harvey was dead. He was so confident that she would take them and she would die that he started talking about her death to other people, and she hadn't even died. And that's what aroused some suspicion. He was supremely confident yeah. <laughs> this had happened. So yeah, he couldn't he couldn't witness the deaths, but he was absolutely confident that they would die and did not give a fuck about it. Interesting psychological conundrum. And the big question, Nick, was he the Ripper? No, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. I'm going to go out on a limb and say absolutely fucking not. He was a narcissist. He who, was in prison. Who, yeah, he was in prison, and he was a narcissist who wanted publicity. But no, absolutely no, no chance in hell. He's still on the list, even though a lot of people have discredited it. The main things for him being the Ripper, he was a trained... He had the hat. He had the hat. He had the big hat. He was a doctor. He was a trained doctor. So he had the medical training. He was very vengeful against prostitutes. He changed his MO, which is a case against. Killers don't normally change their MO, but it's the same thing that was talked about with George Chapman, the first person who was a Ripper suspect that we talked about, who was much of a stronger case. Not not much of a stronger case, but possibly more so than this. The stronger than this. But <laughs> the idea that, you know, okay, well, they're looking for someone who's ripping people apart. Okay, now I'll just switch to strict nine, which is another horrible way to die, a torturous, nasty way. Yeah, but they're not even stick around to watch it happen. Yes. Yeah, he's not, he's not sticking around to watch it happen maybe maybe he changes his mo completely as the ripper maybe he's that smart nah. i think the nah. biggest case nah. against it it was he was in prison the entire time <laughs> of the ripper killings there are so many theories once the ripperologists get hold of it and if you're a ripperologist i love you i love reading about ripper but stories but it was the queen there are, it was victoria there are, it, was it was the queen, queen victoria um no, there are plenty of people who say no he bribed the guards and he escaped from joliet prison or that he paid a double to serve his time for him so he could go to England. No, 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 none, no, of no. none of that. One of the other theories is that those famous last words of I am Jack is that he was actually saying I am ejaculating. See, that's a... Uh, why, why would you say that? Um, not necessarily in the sexy way that we associate ejaculating with, but that he was losing <laughs> control of his bodily functions and that he, he said, I'm ejaculating, as in he's pissing himself or, or, or worse. Or but anything. you don't say that. And even then, you would know, again, just no. That's just someone trying to take that and twist it into something he could have said, where he probably said it just because he wanted to get another shock out of people. Or maybe he was trying to stay the executioner. Maybe he was trying to stay his hand and say, Wait, no, I'm Jack the Ripper. You can't kill me. <laughs> I'm Queen Victoria. I'm, yes, I'm the Queen, don't you I'm know? the Queen's long lost wife. <laughs> most Ripperologists and most writings on it, they go, nah. nah. But he stays in the canon because of it. He Because it, it's a great story. Mm. That's why I wanted to start with the gravestone as well. The gravestone, interestingly... Is it still there? I don't know if it's still there. People don't know who put it up. So, so. there we go good story thomas neil cream what do you think do you have theories do you have ideas do you have information that could lead to his oh no he's already dead do you know about the archbishop of canterbury and what he did at the time <laughs> tell me what you think is in a mysterium cocktail what should be in a mysterium cocktail i finished the other cocktail Bleh. it was nice Mine's still sitting there. It. Yeah. let's go get on the sink in a minute oh god no just down it no. in one it'll be no. fine Horrible. good for you stout is good for you full of iron i can suck on a nail <laughs> um big shout out this week as well to all of our new followers and listeners we've had a wonderful week we hit 5000 downloads uh, it's amazing it's still mm. climbing big thank you to castbox fm who featured us last week and that has brought a lot of you gorgeous lovely listeners to our door we are so appreciative later on this evening we shall be posting our cocktail recipe for the questionable cocktail <laughs> what do we call it the expletive deleted d deleted i'll put it i'll put it out there if you do try it let me know what you think yes i'm not convinced but obviously sinead likes it so come and say hello always good to meet new people especially in this crazy time of sitting at home and going a bit mad it's nice to nice to be able to have a chat and if you've got any special shout outs for people that you want to make during lockdown, loved ones you can't see, neighbours that you love, independent businesses you want to give a shout out to, let's just share the love a little bit more, get in touch and we will do our very best to do it. My shout out is to Miss Rowanna Bond Yay! from our special episode uh, last week. We've had some fantastic feedback um, and some fantastic comments about Rose 
involvement. Um, so I'm sure, and I know she enjoyed doing it, so I'm sure she will be back. So we have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week, and remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Bye!